Hello there, it's Alana Taki. I'm the lead faculty for Math 131. And I wanted to um, run through some basic things with the calculator for you from chapter one of Math 131. So the first thing we're gonna look at is how to, oops, I'm gonna pull my notes, how to graph functions with a calculator. Okay, so if you look at a calculator, it has the, the lower portion down here of all these buttons and then this upper portion, right? And then on this upper portion, there are these five buttons, the Y equals button, the window button, and so on. Those are the graphing buttons. These buttons are what make it a graphing calculator. The rest of the stuff is really all available in a scientific calculator for the most part. But what makes it special is having all of these five buttons up here because these are what make it graph. So I've already pressed this, but I'll do it again. So you press Y equals, which is this top button right here. And it's going to get you to this screen that you're looking at where it says plot one, plot two, plot three, which are stat plots that we'll talk about later in chapter two. And then it has all these different things. You could plot one function, two functions, three functions, and so on. I think it'll let you um, put in as many as 10. All right, so I'm going to graph something simple like, I don't know, 3x minus 4. So if I want to do y equals 3x minus 4, that's 3x. X is this button right here. It's got a lot of letters on it. Um, and in our course, it's always going to be x. The the t and the, that's actually theta, which is a Greek letter. It looks like a zero, I know, but it's theta. And there's n in there. Those are for when you change the mode of your calculator to a different mode like parametric mode, if you've ever heard of that, or polar mode, or whatever. We're never going to deal with any of that stuff in Math 131, so you don't ever have to worry about it. Um, that's stuff that we would deal with in pre-calculus 141 or calculus, okay, which is 151. So for us, it's always going to be the X, right? So that's the button, the X button. And then you'd say, oh, I can't remember what I said. I think I said minus 4, so let me put in minus 4. Now be careful. When you want minus, I think I've mentioned this in another video somewhere, but you don't want this little guy down here, um, kind of this lighter colored button. That's a negative symbol. It looks a little smaller and it's a little higher. What that's going to be is 3x times negative 4 which it's not going to like, right? So if you want subtraction, you have to use these gray buttons over here. These are the operators. So you, you want to use that big button and you can see it comes in as a bigger dash. All right, so I can just press graph and you're thinking, oh, well, that's no good. That looks terrible. That's not what I want at all. Yes, I did it on purpose because I want to talk about the next thing. So we, we've got a graph, it's there. And it's so funny because a lot of times students will come up to me on a test and they'll say, my calculator's broken, ah, you know, because I can't see the graph. And I say, well, no, no, it's not broken. You've got that line in there, see, 3x minus 4. And that equal sign is dark, so it's going to graph it. It's just a question of can you see it on your window, right? This is a window that you're trying to look at that graph. That graph goes on forever and ever. Does your window get to a good view of it? In this case, I would have to say, no, it doesn't. So we have down here how to adjust the window. Now, there are two main ways that we're going to do this, which is playing with the window itself in the window settings and playing with the zoom. So let me go um, start with window first. All right, so if I press window, you can see it has a laundry list of stuff here. It's saying your x min, which is, let me go back to the graph real quick. That's the, remember x is your left and right, right? It's your horizontal axis. So your min is over here, the lowest number on the x. And then your max is over here, the highest number on the x. And then the tick, the scale is how much each tick mark is worth, right? So one, two, three, and so on. Yep, that's what we had. So it had a min of negative 0.5 and a max of 17.5. Well, that's no good. Let's do negative five and five just for the heck of it. And scale is one, I don't mind that, that's good. Scale is the kind of thing you don't really ever have to change it, but we often do. Like if you're gonna go to like a thousand or something, then you might want each tick mark to be worth a hundred. Or if you're gonna go to 10,000, you might want each tick to be worth a thousand or something like that you know you only want like 10 to 20 ticks on a screen um, again you don't really ever have to change it but you know if you want it to look pretty then you change the scale but one is fine that means it's gonna go like negative 5 negative 4 negative 3 negative 2 and so on right up by ones every time now the Y values so that's our X min and X max if I press graph you can see it changed it negative 5 there's 5 but this is still terrible for the y's because, I mean, I'm seeing all this stuff up here, but I'm not getting to see the y-intercept down here. 
So the Y min is the lowest value here and the Y max is the highest. And again, the scale is what each tick mark is worth. So let's go back and I'm gonna change this to negative five and then five. All right, and again, I don't mind a scale of one on this particular problem. We never um, bother with the resolution thing. Don't, and the delta X, I just ignore that. We'll, um, we're not messing around with our calculators to an extent that, that, that those numbers actually matter to us. What always is gonna matter to us is min, max, sometimes scale, but usually min, max for X, min, max for Y. And for a problem like this, it's really kind of simple. The, the trick is that what if it's like a real life story problem that has real life da data values that makes it much tougher because you generally want quadrant one right because usually the values we're dealing with are positive but not always and then you know how far do you go how, how high up do you go etc and that's kind of a logic question that you have to work through in later chapters again we'll see more of that in chapters two and three and so on all right so that is the window so we were doing all that with the window button but there is another way. Um, there's the zoom menu. Now, the zoom menu actually has a whole bunch of things in here. Like, for example, I could zoom in. So I, to do that, I can zoom number two. So it zooms in. I press enter and it'll zoom in, right? Or I could zoom out. And again, most of the stuff I don't ever actually use. There's only two values that I really use. And by the way, when I'm pressing enter, what I'm doing, it's sort of like a camera. I'm telling it zero, zero is the focus and it's zooming in and zooming out with that as the center of its zoom. Very much like when you take a camera and kind of um, play with the, the knob that zooms in and out. That's sort of what you're doing. It's just mathematically. But again, I don't really use a lot of those. There are two things that I use um, regularly and they are zoom six, which is zoom standard. And that's the one I use a lot of the time. It makes a normal, regular window from negative 10 to 10, scale of one, negative 10 to 10, scale of one. If I go to the window, you can see negative 10, 10. Zoom six, and you don't even have to go down to it with an arrow. You can actually just press six. The menus on a TI calculator are hot keyed. So whatever number you see, that'll automatically happen. The other one I use a lot, and it won't work right now because I don't have any statistics in the calculator. Again, this is a chapter two thing, but the only other one that I ever use in class besides Zoom 6 is Zoom 9, which is the Zoom stat button. And again, we'll talk more about that later on um, in chapter two. It actually won't work right now. It'll give me an error. Oh, at least, oh no, it won't because I don't have anything on there. So it doesn't do anything right now, but it will be very handy to you later on. Um, in chapters two, three, and beyond for pretty much every story problem. All right, so that's how to adjust your window. And then let's see. Um, oh, how to view a table. Oh, very nice. Oh, before I leave the window thing behind, let me just reiterate this, what was said in the notes, but I'll say it again. You have to be really patient um, because it can be really tricky to work correctly especially with story problems. It can be hard to figure out what the limits are. It can be hard to um, just just to figure out where you should be going. And a lot of times students get excited about playing around with some of the other Zooms. I find that in the end, they end up mucking around with their calculator so much that they can't figure out what the heck to do. So if you're stuck and you don't know what else to do, try Zoom 6. Like try getting back to a regular window and then work from there. And um, I wouldn't mess around with too many of these other ones. I mean, they're fun if you want to play with them, but they're not really useful. Zoom six, zoom nine. Those are the two zooms we use a lot. Any other adjusting we want to do, we generally use the window. All right, now how to find the table. This is a beautiful thing about this calculator is that it gives you a table of values. I know you didn't realize it, but it does. So once you've typed in an equation in here, it won't do it if there's no equation, but so once I've typed in three X minus four, I can go to the table, see it above the graph button. So you, it's blue on my calculator. So I have to hit second graph and there's a table of values here right so I can go up and down watch there's six there's seven there's eight and so on and you can keep playing around forever honestly well not forever because calculators don't have um, they have battery life but also they run into digitary limits because the calculator will only give you like 
something like 10 digits or something like that and you're and then you're done but you can play around in here and go backwards and forwards now the interesting thing is i don't know why but it won't let you do it for y's so if you get yourself over into the y column you can go up and down but you can't get any further in the up direction it just goes up to y1 and stops and it tells you hey that's 3x minus 4 congratulations right now you're thinking, well, why would that be useful? Well, suppose I had one equation that was 3x minus 4 and then another one that was 4x plus 6 or something like that. Well, then when I go to the table, I can see both of them. And then if you're like, oh man, which one was which? If you go up, it says, oh, that one was 3x minus 4. And if I go over, that one was 4x plus 6, right? So that's why they do it that way. So you can't actually go up forever in the y's. But if you go over here to the x direction and kind of go up, 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 then you can go see things that were further, right? So it's just a weird quirk of the, the TI calculators. Um, the y's, you can't go up, but you can go down. The x's, you can go up or down. That's just how they are. But it shows you all these points. So like y1 has a point 511, y2 has a point 526, right? So if you were going to look at these two equations, y1 would have a y-intercept of 0, negative 4, but y2 has a y-intercept of 0, 6, right? This is the same x for both of these. So let me show you the graph. See? 0, 6, that's where that one hits, and 0, negative 4 is where the other one hits. Cool? And it's really nice because it can show you sometimes like where they must have crossed, right? Somewhere in there, like you can see, oh, they must have had an intersection point, you know, somewhere in here because he used to be higher than him and now he's lower than him or whatever. Um, but there's another way to figure that out and we'll do that in chapter three. So just hold off on that. Yeah, see, they must have crossed over each other right there, right? All right, well, we'll learn more about that in a later chapter, but now you guys know how to graph, press graph. You know how to enter the equation in. You've learned that if you don't have it in there, it won't graph it, right? And because let me, let me show you, if I clear and clear it out, then when I press graph, I get to look at a pretty grid, right? So that's not useful at all. So you have to actually have an equation in there if you wanted to look at it. And then um, the window is where you adjust the window um, bit by bit, min to max, min to max. The zoom gives you a couple basic ones, especially zoom six and zoom nine, which we'll talk about later. Trace, I don't do a ton with. Calc, we'll see it in some in later chapters, chapter three in particular, and chapters um, six and seven in particular as well. The only other thing I want to show you real quick is the table set. Because when you look at the table, I don't know if you noticed, but I started off at, um, I think I started off at negative three, and I was going, see how these steps are by one? Negative nine, negative eight, negative seven, negative six, and so on. So if I go to table set, which is above my window, second table set, I can say, oh, the table's starting at negative nine, and it's going up by ones. Well, suppose I want to start it at 20 and go up by twos. I can do that. So when I go back to the table, and always leave those on auto, don't worry about that. So I'll always leave auto. There, it starts at 20, and it's going up by twos, 22, 24, 26, 28, and so on. So you go, oh no, I didn't want that at all. I want to start at zero, and I want, usually we want a delta table of one. Delta, that little triangle, means change. So it means what your steps are worth. All right, I hope that helps you learn how to work the calculator. See you back here for more videos.